committee members. I advise that the meeting of the committee will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken in this meeting. This means that your presence and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend the respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Apologies on leave of absence, I think. Um, Sorry, Chair, um, Councillor Donovan isn't attending tonight. Okay, and we have Councillor Abrams that I think is running late. So thank you. So I seek a movement ascended for the confirmation of the minutes of the meetings on the 2nd of February 2020. Okay, uh, sorry, Councillor Six. Um, <laughs> seconder, Councillor Mackey, thank you. Anyone like to speak to her? No, Councillor Mac, Councillor Sims, sorry. No, thank no? you, Chair. Thank you. Everyone to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. So tonight, we, the um, item 4.1 has been withdrawn. If uh, I believe that uh, Tom has sent out an email to all members. Um, if you require any further information, I'm sure you can um, email him or contact him to get further clarification. Item 4.2, we've got Matt Holmes, which I'm saying that right? Sorry. Um, re uh, thank so, you. So I, I haven't received an email from Tom. I, I, I have. Would you? No. Well, if I haven't got one, I'm sure the only I have not got one. Has everybody got one? I have received one. Did everyone else receive what an email regarding uh, the withdrawal of uh, 4.1? Yeah. No, no, it was a direct email from Tom. It's a 12 Okay. So we'll, we'll forward that to you, Councillor Moran. Okay, th thank you. Um, would you like to begin to have a presentation to start off with? Thank you. Um, so this is a, thank you, Matt. Um, the latest one in our ongoing series of totally data and insights presentations tonight with a bit of a focus on two major pieces of research that were conducted towards the end of 2020. There was a business survey and a resident survey. And we're doing it tonight with what we're presenting tonight is the kind of the material from those two pieces of work that we think will be particularly useful um, when we're coming to building the next business plan and budget and set some context around that. So this slide just shows the basic outline of the content of both surveys. So they cover a lot of ground and what I'll go through tonight is most of the content from the business survey, but it's very little of the content from the resident survey. And there is a full report available for both pieces, which will be distributed afterwards. Now, because these are pieces of research rather than pieces of engagement, I just want to say something about the veracity of the work that's been done. And you know, how we, who we heard from and how representative of the populations that is. So in summary, we achieved a very sound sample. We were going for 800 respondents to the resident survey. I did work, we get 400 in Adelaide and 400 in North Adelaide. We got about 300 in North Adelaide. We got 993 altogether, and that's excluding the few people who did that survey but didn't actually live in the city of Adelaide. Um, we thanked them, but we didn't need them for our purposes. So when we looked at that, 993 people responding to the resident survey, that's and I will use the technical terms, it's a margin of error, plus or minus 3% confidence in a level of 95%, which is very good. Margin of error at uh, plus or minus 5% would have been fantastic. 3% was extraordinary. For the business survey, we would have liked to have had 400 responses across the city. We got 166. Um, it's not a disaster, um, especially when we consider who responded they're mostly small businesses. There are many in the retail and hospitality sector, so it's a good representation of 
our business makeup in the city. And it still gave us a margin error of, error of um, plus or minus 7.5% at that 95% confidence interval. If we were to look a bit deeper into where people were who responded, um, what one of the questions we ask in both services, we ask people just to tell us which part of the city they're in and we break the city into six parts. So we can see from this, what, what this is showing is the difference between how many people responded and the actual proportion of businesses or residents in those smaller areas. So we can see from this that the responding businesses in Upper North Adelaide, in Adelaide North West and Adelaide North East, are all within about 1% of the actual share of businesses in those locations. Businesses in Lower North Adelaide and Adelaide South East were slightly underrepresented, and businesses in Adelaide South West were overrepresented. When it comes to the residents, a similar kind of picture. So residents in both parts of Adelaide and uh, both parts of North Adelaide and Adelaide North East were also within about 1% of the actual share of the residential population, and residents in Adelaide South East and South West are each overrepresented, and those in Adelaide North West are underrepresented by about 7%. Um, I'll just put this out because when you see the full report, there's some comparisons made by areas in the data and it's just something to bear in mind um, when you think about who actually took this survey. If we were to look a little deeper again, we can see who we heard from. So in the residence survey, we know that 18 to 24 year olds are underrepresented in the residence survey. They're only about 9 points, they're less than 10% of respondents, but they're almost 30% of our city population. And those aged 55 to 74 were really strong respondents. We couldn't keep them away from this one. That were 38% um, of respondents and they're about 14% of the residential population. And the respondents from the other age groups were all within about 5% of their actual presence in the city population. In the business survey, we've got a good number of responses from retail and hospitality, so that was really pleasing to see. So the focus from here on is what we can see from these surveys that give us some context for shaping um, the next business plan and budget. And if we get to it, we'll also um, share some of the baseline data that we got from these surveys that we'll be using to measure some of the outcomes in the new strategic plan. So I'll start with the residence survey. As we did in the 2019 residence survey, we asked people what they valued most about living in the city and they gave us similar answers. They said it's, the, it's all about the convenience, it's about the amenities, so the things on offer, is about the amenity of the city and it's about the lifestyle. The lifestyle is those comments around um, being able to walk, not needing a car, needing a car less, things like that. And the response, if we include this question, the response to these questions are, are relevant now because they give us an idea about what needs to be preserved about the city. And this is important to know when we're thinking about our services to the community and the levels of service that we provide. For example, people tell us that they like being able to walk places. That's a reference to the distance between places, but it's also a reference to walking being a pleasant thing to do in a pleasant environment to do it in. So what makes walking pleasant? Well, walking is made pleasant by quality of an environment, clean and safe streets, good lighting, good footpaths, shade, trees, and so on. Now, because um, we were coming out of the worst of COVID at the time, we took the opportunity to ask people about um, the impacts on our city. And we asked residents to tell us all the things they'd done in the month before they took our survey. And what we heard was that 93%, almost all of them, had shopped for groceries. And the same proportion had been to a cafe, restaurant or bar. 84% had visited the parklands. Now, the residents said I was open from the 2nd of October until the 2nd of November. So we can have a look now. We've had our spend map data. Now, we've um, covered spend map data before in these sessions. So we have spend map data for October 2020. And from that, we can see that the total local spend in October 2020 was about 3.6% less than October 2019. Fair enough given the circumstances we've been in. But spending by residents in the local economy is different. It was 12% higher than in October 2019, and resident local spend on dining and entertainment was 16% higher compared to October 2019. So we then asked residents what changes they've made to their daily life since COVID-19. And we can see from the graph here, and there's other research, including by the ABS, is showing the same kind of results um, that residents are avoiding public space. They're not, sorry, they're not avoiding public spaces in general, but they are avoiding large crowds. 
So when it comes to shaping the city's future and what we're doing, I guess the question is how might we manage public spaces? What things do we need to, to do to ensure um, safety in public places and the use of public places? So we can see from a further question in the residence survey that our residents are expecting sanitisation facilities, more cleanliness, and limits on the number of people within spaces. And these are all the kinds of things that the city of Adelaide can influence. So moving on to the uh, business survey. The first one is about confidence. So we took the opportunity to ask businesses about confidence as their only really local level um, source of data for business confidence. And we had 48% of businesses saying that they were confident or somewhat confident about their business future. And as you might expect, more businesses in the retail and hospitality areas were worried about their future than not. So in a survey like this, we couldn't go far enough and ask what's driving those feelings of confidence, but we do, or not, but we can make some assumptions about what those things might be. So things like the sector that the business is in. If their business had started to improve at the time they took the survey, they might have been pinning a lot of hope on their Christmas trade and be feeling good or not. If there seems to be more people in out of the city, that might make them feel more confident. If you've been relying on income supports and you know they're soon going to go away again, it might not make you feel so good. <laughs> Some people may have been able to negotiate reduced rent and there's the other business costs and that ongoing need that now have to transition to their own So there's about 3,800 businesses or organisations in the city of Adelaide um, or registered in the city, registered as an address within the city of Adelaide with a job JobKeeper. So that might be all that is sustaining some businesses and may cause some concern. We also asked about what businesses the council could best do to support them in the short term, sort of three months or immediate, and then in the longer term or a 12 month period. And what businesses said by and large was that council can best help by getting, getting people into the city and growing the overall economy. And advisory services and skills development are the least needed support from us at this stage. Directing council spending to local businesses is also important. So thinking about getting more people into the city, we can see from our network of device, device detection sensors, which we've also talked about before, that while the September quarter of 2020 showed a return between 80% and 85% in the number of devices detected across the city, compared to September quarter 2019, the December quarter showed a decline to an average of 50% compared to 2019. Now, obviously detections in some locations are doing better than others, but that's the overall picture from the network of sensors. And in particular, probably should note that um, December 2020 and January 2021 did not recover. So this may be a reflection of people not spending in anticipation of income losses to come when income supports go next month. Um, it's a pretty typical response in the face of uncertainty for spending to go down and savings to go up if you can. At the time, Council was working to services, or left um, services into 10 categories. So we started this process with the business plan and budget consultation last year where we asked people about performance and importance of our service categories. So we included those questions again in both the business and the resident survey. And this slide shows the three of them compared and the differences between those three sources. So in both the business and the resident survey, They, they, chose, they chose the same sort of categories as being the most important to them. So it's waste, it's infrastructure management, it's asset maintenance. But businesses would, would generally choose economic growth in their top five, whereas residents would usually choose policy and planning in theirs. So again, we couldn't ask people why they chose what they chose in this survey, but businesses would have a core interest with the other question we've heard in growing the overall economy and the policy and planning. If you're a resident, you've got two dwelling, there's things going on around you, that's something you're more likely to have a direct interest, interest in or to be affected by. Performance ratings tell us a bit of a different story. Um, performance tells us about the level of service that is desired. Um, so if we're being told that a service category is performing well, that may mean that we have the level of service just right, 
are possibly too high. If our stakeholders are telling us that a service category is not performing well, this may indicate that the level of service is lower than desired. And again, this shows the differences between the two survey sources. So with the introduction of the new strategic plan last year, and we've got defined new measures of success against each of the outcomes and some of the way that we're measuring those, it was an opportunity to put questions in these pieces of work. So in the business survey, we asked people, the, um, we asked people to rate the level of agreement with the statement the city is a good place to do business. And we had 71% of the businesses who took the survey agreed with that statement. Which is interesting really, isn't it? 71% of you can agree that it's a good place to do business, but only 48% are confident in their business future. And then on the next one, we've got a measure under the environmental leadership outcome, where what we're wanting to measure is that residents agree is taking effective steps to protect our environment. So we asked people that question, and 69% agreed with that proposition. And in the thriving communities outcome, uh, a measure to do with safety. And we've asked the statement, the city has public spaces that I feel safe to use. And 89% agreed with that statement. Generally, we find when we dig into safety deeper at different times of day and different locations, you get um, different responses. But overall, that's the measure for the strategic plan. That's all I have tonight, Deputy Norman. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? And for the clarification required, mm. members, Councillor Martin. Um, yes, I'm wondering if there's a previous survey with which the results of this can be compared. Through you, Chair. I'm Councillor Martin. There is a previous survey. We did the resident survey in 2019, and the full report that will be distributed does make some comparisons between years. And what about business? Are we able to tell whether business confidence? is uh, as it was 12 no, months ago. sorry we can't. This is the first time that we have asked about business confidence. And just in a very general sense, um, but I know we're uh, glass half full people here, um, but 37% um, are confident about the future of their business, but um, there's 37% um, who are extremely worried or fairly worried, that is losing sleep. Mm -hmm. Is that a, um, a substantial figure in your experience of polling of businesses? Three years, Chair, we haven't asked about business confidence before, so I don't know what's important for businesses in our city. Um, but I think that for the business survey, we know of the 166 business people who responded to us, that we know that a lot of them came from the retail and hospitality sector, which yeah. is, of course, one of the areas of business most affected by the pandemic. So I think we could expect to see. It's probably Thank not. It's probably worse than normal. Yeah, it does seem to be an extraordinary figure. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Just on that, I think we read that the most interesting thing is the comparison. I mean, you've got thirty-seven people that are quite happy. Thirty-seven people that are slashing their risk. But maybe normal is thirty-seven it, percent. It, it, it's kind of meaningless when you don't know. When you haven't got compare, is this better than normal at the COVID year? Better than the normal non COVID year? Is it worse than the non COVID year? When you just said it wasn't the same thing that you said, you can assume that it's worse. Well, we can't assume it's worse. Job, job keepers come in, um, people have stayed home in the state, they're putting swimming pools like crazy apparently, and you can't get a seat in the restaurant in North Adelaide, in the good ones anyway. Um, uh, so it, it really, I think these these surveys are moderately interesting, but unless you're seeing a trend, they're completely useless. No, I can't. Is that, is that a question? I don't know. We just go down the tubes, or they're bumping up. Is that, a, is that a question or is that a statement? Just well, I think the seminal point is to know whether things are getting better, worse, and where they're getting worse, and where they're getting better. Well, I think this is the first time we've had businesses surveyed. No, no, and a, this, but I'm not talking about, I'm also talking about residents. Mm -hmm. um, now, you said you have a comparative one, mm -hmm. and that, that would 
piqued my interest rather than, you know, we go to restaurants and say, yeah, you know, all that's great. You feel safe than you did last year, they're safe. The comparison, it's, it's like the budget where we say we want three budgets, the current one being proposed and the two prior ones. So we can see even just the last one's useless because it might be a, 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 re a retrograde thing, it might be against a trend. We need the comparison. They must, they should leave, not you said that you're going to bring them in. But if they're not here, this is not as helpful as it could be. CEO, did you want to uh, add to that? Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Moran. Um, you've been fully aware of over many years we've had different types of surveys with different methodologies, whether it's around resident, businesses, or city users. Um, obviously, having comparative data is much easier to work with. It does give you good trend data, it gives you insights that you're then able to use to inform planning. I think this is a good start. Um, I do think the fact that we are um, actively uh, reaching out to our business community, particularly at this time, and getting some benchmark data that we can use to inform what we do in the next couple of years is good. Um, Megan has indicated we do have comparative data in other reports. We will share that with you. I'm more than happy to come back and ask Megan to come back um, in the near future um, to have another further discussion on those once you've had an opportunity to well, I'd like you to come back. And I think you touched on a point there too, having been here 25 years to your 18, we have sat through many surveys. This is not the first business survey we have, but we keep changing the, 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 the modus operandi, so they're never compa comparable. Can we stick to one so that future councils can see, um, because as you can see in most councils, 50% of people are new councils, and they need to know what's good and what's bad, and what's failing and what's succeeding. I can remember, so I don't really need it, um, learn to get a bit, but these councils need to know, and I just say, saying that is, is really quite, you know, without being too good, it is meaningless without the comparison. Thank and, you, thank you, Councillor. And Moran. we have had other business things. Is there a way we can dig some of them up, if they're not too far in the past, and see if we can get some sort of comparison for the, the businesses, because it really is the businesses we're worried about. Thank you, CEO. Deputy CEO. Uh, thank you, through the Chair. Um, Councillor Moran, if you go on our external website um, you, and look at our research page, you'll be able to access all our research reports. I don't um, know an external... Well, you don't have to if you don't want to, but it's there for you to have a look at. We can ask Lucy perhaps to sit down with you and show you the website and you'll be able to have a look through uh, various research pieces that we have undertaken. I'd, ra I'd rather the administration set up a, a simple... Uh, I, I, I don't know, no, I, I have not the capacity to go through raw data like that and uh, make a comparison. You'll be pleased to know it's not raw data, it's interpreted and analysed and summarised within some quite compelling reports that we shared last year and in previous years, but really happy to take this offline and have further discussion to make sure our research meet and needs meet. Councils. Everybody needs to know. Thank you, Councillor Moran. We'll you. note that we can take that further with administration. Councillor Knoll? Just double checking, uh, in regards to the representation of the businesses uh, being a representative example of the city, you, uh, so it was reasonably consistent according to the number of businesses in each of the precincts? I got that right? Uh, Chair, I didn't cover that, Councillor Canole, um, but I, I just looked at 166 as a whole. Your yeah, number's not really small enough to go down to different areas and yeah. look at it that way. It's no, not, it's not large enough, sorry, to no, that, that, Yeah, because it sort of helps to explain the, you know, each of the precincts and how it re relates to that and, and its uh, you know, proportions. Um, and uh, we, we know that we talked about uh, convenience. Um, when I, and look, I think for our budgets and things like that, uh, I mean, servers of our rate payers and all that is good, but uh, and to help inform uh, where we're going, I mean, we've shown greatly that we're so dependent on people outside. Is there a way that we can um, you know, get information about those people and then so that it's okay, we have businesses here, we do the, all these things. Um, why, you know, what is it that, uh, that we will, can do better or as a city or whatever uh, that will enable you to come in or encourage you to come in and use us uh, so that when we're doing budgets and we're doing, say, what do we want to do, what infrastructure, 
that we can say, oh yeah, well, these are the sorts of things people outside the city want, and this is how we deliver it as a council, and also how we can support our businesses. Is that something that we can do that fits in? Because you've had people outside the city that have uh, put in uh, survey uh, reports as well. Yeah. Um, through you, Chair, I think that there is an opportunity. So one of the other cases that work that we do every year is the City User Profile Survey. Um, so that will come up in April and May. And I think there will be an opportunity to consider some content about what people would like to see more of in the city and that this year that might be pertinent this time. That's not a usual inclusion, but we do there's some cup has some core inclusions, things we ask every every single year. And then we have sort of like a rotation system of other things coming through and including the topic of issues. So it could be an opportunity there and that's very soon as well. Yeah, I mean, it's just that we've got so much change that has happened and, you know, the office situations and people coming to work and whatever. And, uh, yeah, that uh, we can actually put there what the businesses need across what uh, the consumer wants um, and be able to compare that and say, okay, well, how do we do this? Thank you. Um, Councillor Sims. Thanks, um, Chair. I did just want to circle back to um, Councillor Moran's point um, about consistent methodology. So. Is the plan next year to do a survey with similar methodology? And the reason why um, I ask is, I think it would be very interesting to note the impact of things like job keeper, job seeker. Um, I'm very concerned about the impact that the federal government's refusal to increase job seeker will have, um, because a lot of those provisions are going to be ending up very soon. Um, I think that's going to have a huge impact on residents in the city, um, but also uh, by extension businesses because there'll be less money in the economy. Um, so I'd be really interested to look at the effect of some of those things. Um, and also I'm interested, I don't think it was mentioned specifically, but whether there was any um, reference in your work to the supports that have been put in place and the impact that they've had. and. Have you picked up on any anxiety around the Liberal government ripping those things away? Is that something that's come through at all? <laughs> through you, Chair, no, not specifically. We can only make, make assumptions around what might be driving confidence. And I would have thought that JobKeeper would be one of those things that would be affecting business confidence. Yeah, I would have thought so too. Okay, yeah, it'd be really interesting to get um, that data next year and to look at the effect of things like um, the if, if in fact the government does refuse to increase job seeker, what that, that means. Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, just a, a brief question <clears throat> and further to uh, Councillor Moran's arguments. Um, is there any way that we can do this sooner than one year from now? It would seem to me to be given the extraordinary circumstances here now, that if we were able to do this again in 90 days or 120 days, it would be a very valuable tool for observing any deterioration or more significantly any improvement within the business community particularly. The residential survey, I'm quite happy for that to wait for another year, but I think it would be extremely valuable to this council to have contemporary information flowing through to it at this time. Is that possible? Uh, thank you through the chair. Um, obviously um, a lot of um, survey, surveys now um, are, um, have the opportunity to do what we call Pulse surveys, so check-ins on those um, points within the survey that we want to know more about, so whether it's a culture survey as an organisation or um, a health check survey of a community, then absolutely there's opportunity to do Pulse checks. In particular, our areas of interest, but I need to check and whether the methodology for this one will support pulse checks. Um, and so, I just um, in relation to um, business surveys, the reason why this was stopped a few years ago was because the, um, many different organisations do undertake really comprehensive um, surveys of um, business sentiment, so depending on which sector it is. Um, and so um, it was a uh, decision was made at some point, I think before, yeah, it's a few years ago now, um, to um, use the um, data from a whole range of other uh, sources to help inform uh, Council's approach to supporting the business community, I should just say. Uh, look, I accept all of, all of that, Chair. Um, all, all I'm asking is that this survey, which is specifically in parts 
about the City of Adelaide, the services the City of Adelaide delivers, that those questions are replicated so that we have a point of comparison. And that would be really, really useful, I think, for this council in the coming months. Mm. Thank you. So Megan, is Pulse Check um, able to be um, developed and delivered? Subject to budget, I would have Well, the business survey last year was done um, entirely online, and the only costs besides staff were the marketing and communication to actually encourage people to respond. Um, so fundamentally, we've got it set up. It's just a matter of deciding what you want to ask. Um, can I just say this, the, the approach to services is changing, so we're not going to ask you here. Would be something again with service categories. Um, so, but you know, you do it, you do it often, and it doesn't take long to build up a, a, a training. Yeah. I think yeah. that's a uh, could, could we also do that for residents as well? Would be really useful to get that data. The board. Is the focus more on businesses though or on residents? Yeah, with I mean, council I mean, We should do the residents more often, but not as often. No, no, yeah. we don't have to do that. Yeah. Well, we do this every 12 months, yeah. so um, pulse checks we can do for businesses. I yeah. think we're looking to that. Yeah. And I think that's what we're looking at very crucial at the moment because, as you mentioned, JobKeeper and everything, things are changing. That's right. That's so we want to see what those trends would um, happen with I guess access to the area. Interesting yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Canon. Just on that, uh, you know, getting a bit more information, you know, I think if we're able to also benchmark it where possible using the external data against the outside of the city, because it's one thing for us to say as businesses, um, you know, we have a problem here, which is obviously evident, uh, but how is that re relative to outside the city? And because that gives us the comparison about how much we are, uh, you know, have, have a greater problem than outside, and then, okay, what are the things we need to be doing that levels may help us to decide uh, the sorts of things we're doing in the areas that we have a greater problem in. You know, it's just if that's possible through the external data that you're collecting, in that way it's a good comparison. Thank you, members. Okay. I tend to agree with Councillor Martin. I think, you know, we need to have regular check-ins with our businesses. So I think that's a, a great idea. If we can do that by poll surveys and also but with reference to Councillor Canole, you know, the outs, what will bring people into our city. I think we need to know that as a city as well. So that will be a great idea. So thank you very much. Uh, item uh, 4.3, um, Ian, would you like to introduce this one? Thank you uh, to the Chair, I'll be back at the table to the elected members. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, got tonight, got the um, Acting Director of City Shaping, Tom McCready is here. Got the uh, Theo Maris AM, the Chair of ACMA, and um, Mark Ruth from BRM Advisory, who's been working with us for quite some time now on um, revised ACMA Charter. Uh, just by way of introduction, the current charter is um, circa 2014. Um, the previous board had asked um, for a modernisation and review of the charter as a foundation document. Um, obviously there were some changes with the board, expiry of board uh, chair and some members there and the current charter didn't allow for those things to be extended. So we went through a process of recruiting um, to new board members. Um, obviously the chair is here tonight plus um, several other board members which has been a really positive step forward. Um, obviously the Central Market Arcade which you're all fully across is a fundamental game changer for the market as a whole and you'll hear a bit more about that tonight. Um, with the development approval now through SCAP obviously that takes real shape and real meaning. Um, what does that mean for the charter and the management for the, for the market as an entity? Um, and some of that comes down to the core roles and responsibilities of what ACMA will do and what the City of Adelaide will do. Um, and to some degree what um, ICD may do around that space. And so the, the Charter becomes a really, really important foundation document for setting out um, who does what. So tonight we've, uh, we're doing a, a workshop to work through some of the issues. We'll take the papers pretty much as read, but there are um, some questions there that are quite, quite direct quite clear and we're certainly looking for some some feedback and advice from members on, on some next steps. So I might hand over to um, the Acting Director of City Services.
Thank you, and through you, presiding member. Uh, firstly, uh, what I'll do is just let Theo just introduce the charter, and then we'll get into the questions and see what that's read. Yeah. Now she was also uh, conscious of the recent motion on notice and also the question on notice in regards to the, the foundation documents. We're happy to hear uh, some questions in regards to that. How we've interpreted it, but I'll hand over to the chair, Akma, to, to start, and then we'll get into the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. I don't know that I need a speaker, but I'll try. Um, for me, it's very simple, and the situation is as follows. Um, ACMA recognised very clearly that the central market belongs to the Adelaide City Council, and we'd like to simplify the whole situation. We'd like to take a position where we are acting as the manager of the central market and all of what has been put together over many, many years is foreign to me in uh, property. I have 45 years experience in how to manage and own and run these things, but I think that the system that's there at the moment is cumbersome and it takes away, for me, it takes away the ownership away from the owners and that shouldn't be the case. We will return that ownership back. We want to manage it. Um, the asset management uh, and the spending of improvements of mechanical, electrical, hydraulics and all of those issues um, are very simple to put into a predetermined plan. Um, everybody will have a budget. Everybody will know what will be happening. And um, for us, it's about the improvement of the asset, not only for a return to the council, but also uh, it is a very um, unique place for, for the city, for the people of the city, um, and we like to improve uh, the returns as well. That is our aim. Uh, we have talked about this time and time again, and we're here today to answer any questions that you have. Of, I don't know about the spelling in the English, but anyway. Um, I'll just keep one with that, we can pass these around. These will be helpful because it states our position um, fairly clearly. Would you like to have a moment to read that or we're all good to questions? Um, this is the same motion that was approved or presented by Council. I haven't I seen it. I haven't seen it, so no, no, I couldn't no, make no. comments. No, no. I, uh, no, this is something that Christine um, and I have sort of sat down with. Uh, I don't know if the issues are the same, but this is what we have worked out. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. No, it's the same. It's the same way. Request the council administration modernise and finalise all of the redrafted foundational documents for the governance of the Adelaide. That's an extract of what we talked about in our meeting with council. Exactly. It's presented on behalf of. Yes, yeah, so oh, Councillor Hyde presented it's... the motion on behalf of the. Uh, no, okay. So any. It wasn't explained to us that it was on your behalf. No, right, okay. Explained. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm, um, I think that was. I think important. it was explained during the meeting, but maybe it was not understood correctly. Councillor Martin? Yeah, well, just a question. Um, and I am genuinely asking for some understanding. Um, I understand uh, what the authority is telling us. Um, at the council meeting on the 28th, um, in introducing this, Councillor Hyde told us there had been a draft charter prepared by the administration, which was bad. Um, in fact, the dog had eaten its own homework, I think were the words he used. Um, is this the dog's homework here in the council papers, or is it a fresh document? Is this a, an amended fresh document? I'm just Deputy asking so I know where we are in the sequence. Deputy CEO. Sorry, there's too many microphones on. Oh, sorry. Uh, through the presiding member, um, I haven't actually seen what the chair of um, no, it's has the circulated. Yeah, so in terms of what um, Councillor Hyde moved on the 28th of January, you were asking is that the same as what's 
I haven't seen what's just been handed around. Um, what was moved on the 28th of January was a um, detailed resolution. Um, I would need to pause the meeting if that was appropriate and if you wanted us to go through and compare. Well, can How I about if I can help to clarify? Yeah, yes, can I? That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is whether the council administration document separate to the ACMA proposal and the motion that was presented on the 28th, the council documents are these the original uh, thoughts that were presented to ACMA, which was the dog's homework, or is this an amended version that is before us? I'm just trying to understand, there was a draft, there's a, another draft, and there's another draft. Which one, which, which one am I looking at? Um, it's been a work in progress. So as Ian said when he introduced it, um, Tom and the team have been working um, for quite some time on reviewing the charter. So Tom, do you just want to talk, remind council members of the process that we've been through? Thank you, uh, Acting CEO, um, through you, Chair. Just in response, the, when we get to the questions, the questions in essence are tackling both in regards to what a contemporary charter would look like as requested by ACMA and also in response to the motion on notice. I also attempted through the question on notice to be able to respond to that as well. I think if we get to the questions, what will happen is you'll start to see how it actually flows to what the, the intent of Councillor Hyde and also what the Chair of ACMA has presented. And fundamentally, it talks to the simplification of a charter. It talks to the flow of revenues and expenditure. It talks to capital requests. And it talks to a number of items which are all contained within the motion on notice that was actually endorsed by council. So if we can get to the questions fundamentally, we'll be able to respond to that and to open the questions as well. So I think at this point, members, um, I think administration just asking for clarifications on the questions that we have before you and your thoughts and, and uh, if you have any question, questions in regards to what they have before you. So, um, Councillor Martin. Yep. Um, look, it's, I, I think it's clear. Um, I, I guess the, the things that aren't clear to me is, are that is it proposed that the board will continue much as it is with the representation apart from the trader representation, which is outlined in the guiding principles and operate in the same way with an administrative structure reporting to it that remains unchanged? Yes. Okay. Um, is it being proposed that the car park, which is currently um, uh, almost exclusively um, a source of revenue for the Central Market Authority would continue under this model as well? Through, through you, presiding member, as you can see on the first question, the role of ECMA and the second dot point, the change of responsibility to manage Central Market Car Park. Effectively, what that means is the car park would return to you park under council's uh, jurisdiction, the revenues would come back. However, the car park is clearly essential and ancillary to the central market activities. We would work very closely through either service level agreements or an understanding so we can drive retail into the central market. So the revenues would come back and it would be managed by you park. Okay, and it, the central market receives the monies from uh, lease agreements with tenants. Under this model, it's proposed that uh, the central market would model the uh, would manage the central market arcade. Would monies from uh, leases flow also to the central market from the central market arcade? Tom, through you, presiding member, that's indeed correct. So, uh, as council would remember, that uh, as part of the central market arcade redevelopment, the lease revenue generated from that was actually <coughs> required in regards to the offset for the capital expenditure and naturally the ACMA revenue or the central market revenue would return back into council. However, that would be offs offset by a management fee coming through and also a capital request as per every normal program. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. Uh, you lost me. Um, <laughs> revenues, two sorry, revenues collected from leases from both the entity, which is central market, and the arcade would come back into council. Okay, and so is it that the administration is saying that there would be a management fee, a charge levied by the Central Market Authority at all for managing those properties? 
through you, presiding member, the intention would be to set up a fund for the management of, not necessarily a lease fee, but it would be a management fee. So in, in respect to the revenues come back, there would be an operational funding model set up to allow central market to market the one market. Okay, and has the administration done any modeling, financial modeling about the impact of such an arrangement on the long-term financial plan. And the re reason I ask that is because we have serious debt problems. What What is the impact on the long-term financial plan of both council um, inserting the central market authority as the manager of the central market RJ for whatever fee is agreed, um, the uh, assumption of responsibility for the capital works uh, and the changes that occur with the car park. Is this a modeling we can see? Hey, Tom. Through you, presiding member, I, in response to the question on notice at the last council meeting, it would be net zero in regards to a change. However, I would actually say, in speaking to the chair and, and understanding the drive to commercialise and to increase the profitability of the market, it actually would be enhanced. So, council could potentially be better off. A worst case scenario, net zero, because the reality is all you're doing is looking at the treatment and making it simplified. At the minute, you do not have clear line of sight in regards to certain activities. This provides clear line of sight in regards to capital, revenue, and the expenditure going through, and council's in control of that. Could I ask the administration, and, and I'm happy to accept that, could, could you actually let us have a look at the financial modeling you've done that enables um, Tom to give us that? Um, that? That would be really, really useful. Can that be shared around with all members? Yes, of course. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, I, I don't have any further questions. I'm happy to offer certain comments, but if you'd prefer others to ask questions. I would appreciate that, Councillor Martin. Anyone else would like to um, have any questions on, on this, uh, of any of the key questions in front of you? Are any questions or comments? Or... Well, at this, stage, at this stage of administration, I'm looking for some sort of guidance in what, what we're thinking. So at this point, I would like a discussion. I just have a question, but knowing I've already put my views on the members first, but just a question if I could. Um, uh, the, uh, the authority pays uh, substantial funds per annum for the use of the UPART licence. Is the administration able to detail? So, so when it's said that, that ACMA collects all of that funding, it's not actually correct. Um, is the administration able to detail what those what those costs are that are paid to the City of Adelaide? Or is that confidence or could that be circulated? Uh, Tom? Through you, presiding member, I could right now, but that would be commercial confidence. I can certainly present that to elected members as an undertaking, um, but it covers various things, administration, car, car park, market complex and management fee, which I have before me, but certainly can present that back. But the intention is to have a fee to run the market on behalf of council as a section 42 subsidiary. So members, um, any questions regarding the role of ACMA governance financial and their operating um, before I'm sure there's some people that probably want to speak to it, but uh, I would like to give guidance to administration regarding these key questions. Councillor Hyde. And just furthermore on the finances, could the administration please confirm um, whether or not at the end of the day, sorry, if I could ask my question. Are we Chair. supposed to be debating this? Aren't we we're not, we're not, we're not debating. Questions. He's asking questions in relation to the matter, so we can, you can ask questions. Okay, just questions. Well, you can actually have a discussion. We're in a workshop, we're not in committee. We're not in, we're in a workshop. Chair, I think that there's an urge to debate. Well, I'm trying to keep that under control, Councillor Moran. <laughs> I don't think you need to do that. <laughs> Um, uh, regarding the assertions made in the long-term financial plan, could the administration please uh, detail whether or not uh, ACMA's, at the end of the day, ACMA's uh, financial position is completely reflected in our long-term financial plan? So I thought as a subsidiary, they are. Tom? Do you presiding a member, every bit of dollar spent and every bit of dollar made is actually reflected in a long-term financial plan and is also presented in our annual business and plan and budget reports, both the new and the actual, so it is reflected. And, and so if I could share, so the, the monies that have been expended by ACMA on maintaining the, the asset, being the market, um, uh, those, those monies at the end of the day be reflected in our in our financial positions, wouldn't they? 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. Members, any uh, more direction to be given to you? Oh, Lord Mayor, sorry, didn't see your hand there. That's all right. I'll do this. Um, just towards the questions and um, just uh, in terms of some of the other questions, I would like to clearly see what that means in terms of our finances so that we can pull that out and just have a, a bit of a deep dive into that. Um, I do, my, my view is I do agree with expanding the role of Ackman to curate uh, the market and manage the market offering. I think that makes perfect sense, particularly when we've spent so much time talking about the integration of the market with Market Square, um, and so that we can actually make sure that uh, the offering is entirely complementary and works to what we're trying to achieve there. Um, the change of responsibility with Central Market Car Park, um, I'm, I'm sure that I'm not the only one that had several conversations with Nick Bagarkas over the last few years about the two twos and fro's of whether um, ACMA should be running the car park. Um, I, with that undertaking, obviously, there would be a service agreement so that we can make sure that the uh, the car parking arrangement is to the best advantage of people coming to shop in the central market. I'd be very happy for that responsibility to come back and be managed as part of our new car offering. Um, I am making some assumptions that you part plus and everything on the being so I know that that's working. So uh, there are some benefits to that. Um, a more integrated governance model. Um, yes, that would be good. We should actually try to make sure. I think it's great with the new board and the new chair that we can actually have another look at that. Um, audit committee being ACMAS audit committee. Again, we've got a great audit committee with three independent members. Um, and I think that the finances do come through with all our reviews anyway, quarterly reviews, and annual reviews, etc. cetera. Um, so I would be supportive of that. And the asset management decision-making would be in a similar way that it should be working is that the asset management plan would be done for the central market and that would come in and through our business plan and budget um, deliberations. Um, in terms of revenues, and a, uh, that expenses are managed by ACMA. Um, it, it, again, it makes sense to me. It's a it's a city of Adelaide asset, uh, but of course we need to make sure that the management of that asset is sitting and um, is funded uh, so that they can manage the asset properly. Um, uh, in terms of leasing and uh, marketing. Um, I'm not sure what support services provided is that is that just marketing support support services provided to ACMA at no cost. I wasn't quite sure what that Can meant. I respond to it? Yes, please. Through you just saying, Amber, the, the intention is that uh, through the reshaping within the organisation, we will we'll take in the house the activities. And the reason being is one is to simplify it, and two is to have a clear clearer line of sight in regards to the business operations and financial operations. So we'd be doing that in, uh, internally to support. So it's the same with the administrative functions. Um, I think that we've got a, a real opportunity here to um, take ACMA to the next level, if you like, by uh, making sure that obviously we'd have targets and stretch targets for uh, a return to the City of Adelaide as an asset. But also uh, the main thing for me is the ability for ACMA to curate the market to make sure that the integration is uh, first and foremost in terms of how the new um, Market Square offering is going to work. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Fennell. Councillor Martin. I suppose a bit of a mix. I mean, um, just, re just from that last comment in regards to control over the administration, um, I mean, I would see that ACMA and, and the actual administration component over the market would be uh, closely linked simply because they're meant to be directing it. I mean, if that's I mean, it's just uh, how I understand it. Um, but uh, overall, when we are just looking, I'll go going through my list rather than necessarily talk to the, to the questions. And that is, yes, it is, I consider, yes, it's really uh, critical that we have a very clear line between the charter and the operating lease and head leases, et cetera, so that, you know, it's very simply defined. Um, 
And also, I think uh, with, and this is now talking about the transition with the new development, that uh, there is a, a, a clear ability for the um, ACMA to have involvement in uh, what happens in the new development so that there is the capacity for them to have a synergy and also an input into how that looks because it's, uh, I mean, we are talking about consumers and um, that we uh, are reflecting what uh, our, our customers want and they're able to, to do that and, and obviously working together with uh, administration. Um, and also between that and uh, IACD in regards to where are you know, our responsibilities and where is ICD and because it been, so it's more clearly defined, particularly with all responsibilities around uh, you know, public safety and things like that. Um, I mean, it's, for me, when I see that there is still that $17, $18 million uh, uh, number uh, in regards to what was given uh, to, for, the, uh, you know, for the market to get its services and that into, um, you know, uh, up to standard, it's, I suppose that's the best uh, answer to why you want it back in administration, why you want it back in the council, because it can be accounted for well within the, uh, within the, uh, the council rather than necessarily this one way street where it can't be properly accounted for as, a, and as, a, a, as an accounting item. Item. Um, I do agree the car park is a support, and I do, but I do think the car park is probably linked to all of our car parks as being part of that. As uh, so, if we're able to do that as you know as a greater Adelaide, uh, that would be fantastic. That means that that it can be used as a as an asset to help drive uh, our customers, but also ways in which we maybe defray some of the costs with working with retailers, etc., so that we are going to attract more customers and give uh, our customers benefits. Um, and now just in regards, uh, I mean, the purpose of why the, the, for the trade of representative, etc., was on the market was because of the uh, linear uh, communication with, uh, you know, from the board through the administration and then into the traders. So. There is potentially then another way to look at this as, uh, as getting a better variety is that we could potentially say that there is a, a separate committee because of the uh, confidentiality issues, etc., around trader being on a board, that we potentially could have an, a committee where it has a group of traders with board members and administration that will... Oh, France, give it a rest. A couple of moments. Just finish off. Anyway, so just that we make sure that they have that representation that the uh, Traders Association is still in the Charter because they, that's important to have that communication with them um, and enable them to actually uh, inf uh, speak to um, uh, the, the board and to council rather than necessarily being part of the, the com uh, communication chain. Thank you. Councillor Martin. I look up, uh, Chair, I'm really sorry that uh, the communication with Franz isn't up to what he expects as a trader, but nevertheless, I did want to ask a question with regard to the audit committee. Um, assuming responsibility for audit. Um, uh, can I ask the question of the administration, or perhaps Mark Booth, is there any disadvantage in having our own audit committee oversee as well the Central Market Authority looking after the Central Market Arcade? Okay. Um, Tom, could you answer that? Through your presiding, presiding member, no, actually, it, it's probably better in regards to they have a clear line of sight to all activities that council are actually responsible for. So they see a more holistic approach in regards to all the auditing items that they need to actually clear. Okay. Um, then just a couple of quick comments. Uh, um, I, look, I must say that one of uh, my worst nightmares about this Central Market Arcade redevelopment was that we would end up with something with row upon row of Louis Vuittons and Dolce and Gabbanas and others. Um, and God knows there are plenty of those shops in this world. Um, the central market is a um, the central market is a, a unique location, and uh, placing alongside it something that is not complementary and compatible would have been a very good way, I think, to um, to damage the market to do something that may impede its progress over the years. So um, I am fully supportive of the idea of the central market, assuming responsibility for the curation of the central market arcade. I think it makes absolute um, sense to do so and as quickly as possible, particularly in these planning phases right now. Um, and uh, I think that the, uh, the central market authority will do a much better job 
on the ground than we could possibly hope to do from Town Hall. Um, I, I do want to see those figures though. I think it's really important for this council, if it is going to sign off on this, to have an absolute understanding on the bottom line, because the bottom line, as we know here, is something that we have to watch. So um, conditional on that information, panning out as we're told it will be, um, I think this is great and one of the uh, best decisions of council this year so far. Theo, did you want to, sorry, Theo, did you want to respond to that? Well, workshop, workshop, workshop. discussions with council. That's right. Yes. Well, key questions. I think the last comment is very important to us and to you. Um, of course, we have to sit down and work out precisely what the return is expected to be with a little bit of a leeway up or down. Um, we want to do that as quickly as possible, but get into the final detail of doing that because the size of shops and the nature of the shops will um, determine the return. Um, I can just say this, that um, whilst I'm standing, there will be no way to talk. And I did show that I don't wait for any time. <laughs> Um, but just to finalise, I'm sorry I'm taking up your valuable time. Um, one thing that I need to point out is that every major centre um, around the inner metropolitan area is at the moment trying to take over the position of the market. You don't have to go very far. You can have Fruville, you can have Norwood, you can go to Pasadena, you can go all the arc right around. And it's, there, and it's there for one reason, and I'll tell you what, why they're doing it. The profit that comes out of fruit and veg, meat, small goods, and all of the things that the central market sells, wholesome green product, is what everyone is advertising because the dollars are there. Yeah. The dollars are not in this tin can or whatever it is. So they're out there competing. That's why the market needs to grow very quickly, um, and it needs to grow in a manner in which it's going to provide a bigger offer to the client to make it a one-stop shop. There's only one little thing I'll ask, and that is this. Please let's consider the customer coming in and out of the market. It's got to be a situation where someone can drive in easily and come out easily. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Theo. Um, Councillor Kira, did you want to? Uh, yeah, look, it's, it's kind of sort of been answered a bit, but just in relation to the final uh, column of questions, um, should we, efficiencies are always good, uh, but should, should we be concerned at all that uh, a level of subsuming there might mean that there's a, a loss of clarity in terms of the uh, lines of accounting? Um, well, let me put it another way. Uh, will there be mechanisms to ensure that lines of accounting uh, have enough clarity so that we can at least equally to today assess the performance of the asset? Um, the presiding member who was to draw a map, just think of leases and car park revenue coming into council and think about management fee and capital works upon uh, consideration by council going through so there will be clear line of sight in regards to how that transitions and also talking to the performance of the market the one market that's been stipulated there it's been very clear to us for a while is when everyone goes to central market arcade they call it the market so i think you will be have better line of sight in regards to it a more simpler line of sight Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Um, thank you, Chair. Obviously, I've already had most of my views, but I just wanted to um, flag regarding um, regarding the uh, the car park itself. It, you know, the, the the document and the motion talks to may devolve itself, and and that really depends on you know, what the potential report for the for the arcade says, and, and once all those figures which have already been canvassed, sort of, and how they land. Um, uh, but there is definitely a need to, to focus um, the authority's role. They're not a car park operator, they are a, a leasing agent and they should be focused on getting customers in the door and managing um, their tenants well. Um, uh, uh, regarding the audit committee, well, integrated governance, I mean, it sounds good, but um, the motion sort of suggested that uh, there might just be um, an ACMA representative on the SRIA 
um, uh, committee. I, uh, I'm not terribly confident that removing um, ACMA's audit committee um, uh, entirely and, and passing that all on to the City of Adelaide, I just don't feel that would be a, a very good move because ACMA's audit committee has a very clear line of sight over all of the things immediately in front of it. Um, uh, and it manages those risks um, on, a, on a very on a very frequent basis. So um, I'm, I'd be yet to be convinced on that, whereas our audit committee sits a little bit higher, ACMAS is a bit closer to the coalface. So, um, uh, and as well regarding, um, regarding integration generally, and, and I just refer to the, um, I refer to the slideshow as well, and I refer to the previous draft charter. Um, I'm just a little bit concerned that the role of the board in directing the GM would be diluted a little bit. Um, and I think it's just really important to make sure if we've, we've got a subsidiary, we have a skills-based board that we went all, to all the trouble of appointing, the GM must be first and foremost accountable to the board. That's 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 how they work. They can't function any other way. So I just um, uh, want to flag that as well. Obviously, there's a relationship there. Thanks, Tom. Through you, Chair. Uh, just in regards to the general manager, yes, the, the general manager's responsibility is to support the board. However, this, uh, the CEO is technically the employer of that person. So from a legislative perspective, you cannot discount that. The, that is the realities of it. So it's just talking to the mechanisms in regards to reporting mechanisms, but ultimately counts on the city of Adelaide with the corporation is the employer of the staff there. But again, the relationship back to the board is very, very important. Well, so long as that's made clear in the charter, um, because on the first read of the draft charter, it wasn't particularly clear. Um, and it was it was a red flag from my perspective. Um, uh, other than that, I just think that um, look where the administration can support ACMA with services provided on a pro bono basis. And that makes sense. I do would like to echo Councillor Curious' thoughts about avoiding creep and being able to properly properly measure and test. Um, uh, but otherwise, I think this looks pretty good. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Moran? Uh, yes. Um, look, as you know, I was never keen on um, setting up a subsidiary. I think the subsidiary is very young in itself, uh, so it did very well. Um, so, there, ergo, um, I don't really um, <coughs> support, uh, support services being provided to Atma at no cost. Um, I think during the transition, maybe that could be looked at, but the subsidiary, the whole nature of it was to be standing away from us. Um, and some of the things that we wanted, what I agreed to when we set this up, was that we could, that we, the political, um, like traders coming to us saying, Mark, it's where the Lord Mayor's voted from, don't vote for me, um, if you don't do this, da da. And that was kind of one thing I hated handing the mic over to you guys. Um, but that was one of the good things. And we thought in doing that, you'd give us better opening hours. Now, you failed just as we failed. Um, so support services, okay, but not forever. Um, the audit committee, I disagree as usual with Councillor Hyde. I think it's good to come under our um, our audit committee. It's not, you know, we're a small council and the market's a big part of what we should be doing in our audit committee for their coal phase too, to say that, you know, we're up sitting 100 yards from the market and ours is in coal phase of course it is. Um, the opening hours, also um, to take uh, Phil's point back, of course we don't want Amani and um, that, but when we ran the market, we had a very strict, I think it was 29% fresh fruit and vegetables. Now that's down to 11%. And my cookie friends don't go there anymore because they say it's all prepackaged food and yada yada yada. So I hope, Theo, you know, that I know it's difficult to get the, um, the fruit and veg guys in. Uh, we need to really look for them, but I, I hope that there'd be a recognition that they really have dropped to a low level. And as you said, fruit and veg is pretty darn fantastic in the birds now. Uh, North Adelaide have got one of the loveliest ones there, and you probably know them well. Um, so um, you've got to get things that, you know, it's got to be good. And I'm just worried that prepackaged foods and crop machines and that, 
questions in front of you that was provided in, in your papers. Um, so administration is looking for some direction in regards to the unsolicited uh, proposal, so the guidelines, the council is the point, the questions really are asking for a straw poll. Sorry, Brett, did you want to uh, introduce the item? So following the May workshop we had in 2020, there was fairly in-depth discussion in relation to some of the perceived challenges and recruitment opportunities to the unsolicited proposal guideline that by council resolution was suspended. Um, the CEO gave an undertaking to come back in another workshop to, to flesh out some of those focus areas um, for which, having gone back and looked at that workshop, these really were the four key areas to, um, to consider that I think were identified as concerns or challenges for council to improve the guideline. Um, in better transparency um, to the marketplace. And ultimately, I'm having to work through each one. Well, to yeah. my point, Chair, take, take your point, but really, um, these are asking us to give our, to flag our right. You know, what, what members' views of the application officers are absolutely not. Um, what are members' views on reconsidering the new, get, get rid of it? Councillor um, Moran, are you okay. actually speaking to it? Are you actually speaking to the question? No, I'm just making the point that, that this is going to, this is not what a workshop should be doing. Well, this is the uh, structure that we have been guided administration to give to us. We asked it for it to come in as a workshop and we asked them to come in with some key questions in which we could have a discussion and a meaningful discussion in regards to the guidelines that we have for the unsolicited um, proposals. So um, it's a direction that uh, administration took from us and uh, they're just acting on that tonight. Okay. So yeah, question three and four are fine. Um, I think one and two is asking to form an opinion. Well, um, I think um, would you like to continue uh, with the, present, the reasoning behind this, Brett? I'm happy to rephrase the questions to enable general constructive discussion to uh, give administration something to take away and uh, come back to you on for you to consider formally in chambers. Okay, well, let's move forward and see how we go, Councillor Moran. So, Councillor Sims? In terms of um, responding directly to the, the questions, my view would be um, that the park lane should just simply be taken out of the unsolicited bids uh, guideline. I think that's the easiest um, solution. Indeed, that's what I've been arguing um, for some time. Um, members might recall I moved a motion to do that, that it was uh, turned into Stay with the questions. Oh, Stay sorry, with, I thought it was with a workshop. Give a direction. Same with the workshop. Okay. Well, we well, in terms of explaining my rationale for wanting to um, have the parklands carved out of the unsolicited uh, big guideline, the reason why um, 
uh, I'm of that view is because I recall the fiasco that we had with the Adelaide Crows proposal, where a proposal was um, put to uh, council, but because of the unsolicited uh, guideline process, we were not able to um, have any consultation within the community in a meaningful way um, early on. Um, and indeed, some of us as councillors argued for there to be consultation, and we were told um, that we can't have consultation because it is within the um, unsolicited bid guideline um, process. So, so tonight's workshop is about a discussion in regards to what you would like to see in... Well, I'm saying what I would like. I'm yeah, but you're giving like us it. a history of past events, um, yes. your version. Um, and um, we actually want to stick to what we are workshopping tonight. With, with respect, Chair, the reasons why the reasons why I'm talking about the history is to explain why I'm of the view that the unsolicited bid um, guideline is not appropriate for the parklands. Thank you. So we would note that you would like the parklands to not be included in the guidelines. Okay, so we've got that as noted. Um, yeah. Is there anything further you would like to add to that? Yes, um, I'd like to add that I think when we're talking about um, public land, um, we should be able to have open discussions about public land in um, the public realm. And um, if we look at that particular um, scenario, I think members of the community were really concerned that they were being shut out of the process and that their elected representatives were being given information that they were not being given. Um, and um, when concern about that was expressed, we were told, well, I'm sorry, that's because it's under the unsolicited bid um, guideline process and therefore we can't have discussion in the public realm. Yeah. I think there's something seriously wrong um, if the community's representatives can't talk about public land and proposals for public land in the public realm. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Uh, well, Mayor. Um, thank you. Um, before I answer the questions, could I just ask of the um, administration, um, I, I, can, I, can you just explain to us, we've got a fairly uh, well used expression of interest process um, and there's many examples where we've used that expression of interest um, process um, exceptionally well, but uh, what I don't understand is what, what why can't we just use the expression of interest process? What do we need? What would the uh, unsolicited bid proposals give us that an expression that we can't do through an expression of interest process? Exactly. Yeah, that's that's through the chair. No, that's... sorry, I'm asking the CEO. Uh, thank you. So through the chair, um, the. the when Brett ran you through the history and context last April, we did include the slides um, for you to just reacquaint yourselves with the purpose of the unsolicited proposal guideline. Um, so that came about back in 2017 on the back of um, uh, various um, levels of government across Australia putting um, unsolicited proposal guidelines in place to enable better what was seen as better um, ways of working with the private sector from the public sector perspective and trying to mitigate risks associated with doing that. And obviously there's some you know, quite famous examples of where um, sometimes um, how the private sector has engaged with local hasn't always been as transparent as, um, as people would expect. Um, on, the, on the back of um, also as an organisation um, there has been um, times when Brett and I have worked on a project um, a few years ago where um, a private um, operator had tried to engage with the City of Adelaide to um, deliver a proposal um, and from an organisational perspective um, it was clear that um, there was a culture of risk averse, averse um, culture which meant that the idea couldn't get um, any sort of traction. What we had learned through that time as an organisation was actually um, using an expression of, in, of interest process does allow um, the ability to work with private sector. Um, it does allow council um, to own the process in terms of the outcomes it's trying to achieve. 
and also allows um, the, the, the council to, um, you know, still be innovative in its approach. Um, and I think one of the big insights for us as administration was how we approached um, the. I'm probably going to have to put a time on. Me. Um, one of the examples that um, that we that we learned a lot from was the the 10 gig solution where. We actually just went to the market to say, we don't know what the solution looks like, we don't know what it is. Um, we are keen to be a digitally connected city, we want to be the quickest digital, oh, I can say it now, I'm tired. We want to be the quickest connected city in the Southern Hemisphere, which have come on the back of a lot of feedback from businesses. Um, we didn't say what the solution was because we didn't know what the solution was, but we were able to, you know, really drive innovation and work with the private sector to deliver some good outcomes. So, I guess the question for the council is really to start to weigh up um, how you want to make sure that we, as an organisation, are open um, to working with, um, you know, ideas and private sector in a way that um, ensures the community um, and members um, have visibility and the, this process does allow that um, but I think what we found over the years is that um, you know we, we can do it in other ways too. Well we all know we've only used this process once mm -hmm. and I think it was a bit bumpy yeah. um, and so I guess you know I, I am familiar with the, um, the the project that couldn't find its way into council. Have, have we over the years now streamlined so that if somebody has a project or an idea that there is a, an, an easy way for them to bring that into council through through an expression of interest? Through the chair, there is no process. Um, we have suspended the unsolicited proposal guideline. There is no established framework for a proponent to submit an idea. Now, so, any so can I ask though, how the tree climb came in? Because that, that, that was an unsolicited proposal, just as helipad was, just as rooftop housing was. Um, we've had many unsolicited proposals over the years in the absence of a framework. The challenge is we've inconsistently managed them. Um, we've had frustrated feedback from participants that we never developed them to expressions of interest despite giving undertakings to do so. For example, the three unsolicited proposals received for the River Torrance Floating Restaurant. That's we had an undertaking. That's, yeah, without speaking to what it was, that's what we were referring to without naming it. Um, sorry. Is that in confidence, voting restaurant? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't mention it. Um, uh, so I guess there's sort of, you know, in terms of um, the activation of Lady Ada Connell, so we know how to protect our peer if we come through an expression of interest and deal with things that are commercial and confidence. I'm just sort of wondering that aside from this, which I don't think it's working the way we want it to work. So aside from this, is there another way that people can bring these projects? That's what I'm asking. I would say yes, there is, yeah. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Hyde. Sorry, could we get the questions back up? No, we've got the answers, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> what are the questions? Um, uh, I, suppose, I suppose my... Um, my issue with the, just the EOI sitting there as it is, is that it's not um, market-led, is my understanding. Could I just ask, could I just ask through you, Chair, whether or not, so is it the case that the market might come to you with an idea and say, look, we want to do this, and you say, oh, well, we'll just do an expression of interest for probity's sake and to compare apples with apples, or how does it actually work? Yeah, thank you. Through the Chair. I think it's important to clarify an expression of interest process versus a solicited versus an unsolicited idea. 10 gigabit was actually solicited through council. It was an idea generated by council and administration. It was not unsolicited. It was not market led. We then engaged the market through an expression of interest to look at possible solutions. That is, we identified the idea, not the market. Our proposals are a very different context. That says we don't have all the ideas and in uncertain times, the market may very well have good ideas to present to council in an unsolicited fashion. 
That's the fundamental difference. An expression of interest is just a market engagement tool. It is nothing more. You do it for employment, you do it for procurement of goods and services, we do it for sale of property. Um, ADA O'Connell, we did an expression of interest. It wasn't market led, but we did go to the market to test it. Um, and I think that's a common misunderstanding. When we get our solicit proposals, in the absence of a framework or with a framework, we always reserve the right to engage the market. The current guideline says, if it's not sufficiently unique to justify direct exclusive dealing, we may take it to the market for competitive bidding whilst endeavouring to respect your intellectual property. Tree climbing is an excellent example. We got it in, we assessed it. Is it unique? They're not the only ones that can do tree climbing. However, it's a good market opportunity. We'll do an expression of interest but we didn't go out for an expression of the interest for tree climbing. We didn't give their idea to the market. We said, here's vacant land, here's the community land management plan. What can the market do? It could have been a community garden. We respected their intellectual property um, and that's the fundamental difference. Um, and I hope that gives you context. That's the difference between council undertaking a solicited EOI versus an unsolicited market-led proposal. They're very fundamentally different things. An EOI is simply a process. So, so in that example, though, somebody came to us from the. Oh, my apologies. Sorry, uh, sorry. sorry. Council Hyde Council was actually asking questions. No, no, no. no. If you're going to make a good point, then. <laughs> well, you won't know because I said no. I was just like, so in that in that instance where the tree climb came to us with an idea, and then we framed it through the sale and payment took it to market using our expression of interest, isn't that a process that we could do at any time? That's what I don't understand. I think that's a process we could do. If something comes to us with any idea, exactly. we could still go to market and protect the right pay. <coughs> I don't understand why we have to go through this. Sorry, just, I just don't understand. CEO? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I disagree, respectfully. Um, what confidence does the market have in the absence of an undertaking through a formal process that would protect their intellectual property. We could have taken tree climbing and given it to their competitors or notified their competitors to maximise our value and rental return. We could have. Now, of course, we say as a public authority, we'd never do that. But what confidence does the market have to submit intellectual property in the absence of any undertaking under a process that we protect it? We've got a business strategy with the business strategy. This, this is exactly what a workshop should not be doing. Um, I think I will continue with Councillor yeah, Hyde because we're, that's where we had left off. Um, um, it's not uh, helpful when um, administrators are arguing with each other and arguing with the law. No, this is supposed. It's, I didn't it's, ask you, Kira. Um, it's not what we should be doing. This is supposed to be information. Sorry, sorry, Thank Chair. You. Can, no I, can I? Can I? Councillor Moran, Councillor Hyde, can you continue, please? Oh, sorry, I should just go. On. I do just need to comment to address this. As I did say in my, when I spoke earlier that um, Brett's job is to make sure the risk um, associated with us dealing with private sector is managed and mitigated, and that's what we pay him to do. Um, and um, obviously his advice, we absolutely um, we seek his advice whenever we're doing an EOI or any sort of um, procurement activity um, and certainly on anything like an unsolicited proposal. So Brett is coming from a place of just making sure the organisation is protected. Um, my view as an executive is slightly different because I have um, confidence in our abilities as an organisation to manage the level of risk associated um, with some of the challenges that we have. So that is not a disagreement, it's just seeing it from different perspectives and lenses. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hyde. No. Um, <laughs> don't look too excited. Um, uh, I, I suppose regarding, regarding the questions, um, certainly there's something else that needs to be said for questions, the two central questions. Um, regarding public land, park lands, and, um, and uh, making it clear, I think, that public consultation should be included in um, earlier up. Um, uh, I'd, I'd also just provide the feedback that, um, uh, that risk, there, there is certainly risk for the private sector 
um, where a local government may not treat their intellectual property as you know, perhaps they would like, or, or perhaps it's fair, I would actually suggest that the guidelines are important for the other way around as well, because time and time again, I look at things um, on this council that have been done, you know, on a wink and a nudge and a handshake many, many, many moons ago. And I wonder how on earth did that happen? I have. And I think, yeah. I think, no, don't worry, though, before He's council. Not referencing He's already told me I should have been put in prison. He didn't make any reference to and anyone, Councillor Moran. I would suggest that we don't. Not on a week now. He did not make any reference to anyone in particular. I would like to continue. I understand that, Councillor Moran, but he didn't make any reference to anyone. He was just making a generalisation. Well, it's, it's and that incorrect. that is all. It is absolutely no, hey, hey, there was no direct. Chairing che che is not just talking down someone when they're asking. Yeah. No, but I'm just saying. I would, like, say I would like to continue. Mismanaged maladministration of past councils. Councillor Moran, if you have that feeling, yes, then, speak, that's very big words, Councillor Moran, and it's very big to put in this forum right here, right now, in a workshop. Honestly, if you have, feel very strongly about something, please go ahead. No, we can make them as big or small as you like, Councillor Moran, but you can do so in a code of conduct if you wish. Thank you. Chair, Councillor, I'm, I'm happy Hi, to, do you want to continue? I just want to clarify for Councillor Moran's benefit that the, the deals that I'm uh, thinking about, which are in confidence and I cannot mention them, are actually from before her time. So it was actually not a reflection on her at all. Um, um, so, uh, but, but well, the point, if, 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 you need to just let him talk, Councillor Moran, and then I'll come to you, can, you I can put your name down, you're third on my list, I can let you speak. So what is he talking about? Well, talk. Well, if you let him speak, then you'll have your time, Councillor Moran, you're third on my list. Okay, thank you. My feedback, Deputy Lord Mayor, is that um, uh, the risk goes both ways. So it's not just about making sure the business is protected, but it's actually about ensuring some rigour, some policy rigour, to ensure that the ratepayer is protected as well. That's the only point I was trying to make. Um, I do think we, we, we uh, shouldn't be and sort of caught with our pants down and not have any policy. I think we do need some policy in place. I'd be um, open to uh, thinking about other other changes that can be made to the guidelines um, uh, to increase public confidence in them while maintaining private sector confidence in them as well. I'm sure there's a middle point there, um, but I do think it's really important to have a market-led, um, a policy that allows for market-led initiatives to come to us. Thank you. Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Chair. Just um, very quickly, I think in terms of um, what this uh, policy covers, I think anything and everything that we have jurisdiction over, whether it is an asset, public, parklands, whatever it might be, I think it should cover it, um, purely because if, uh, if there's a good idea uh, uh, about a particular issue, um, I don't think we should be turning it down just because this policy doesn't cover it. If someone comes to us and says, hey, I want to fertilise the parklands in this way, then why not, why not look at it? Um, uh, I did, well, I know some people that um, also, I, uh, I'm mindful of how we communicate with uh, with our residents and our ratepayers. So, as long as there is uh, sufficient um, uh, communication with uh, uh, with the public about some of these proposals that do come through, um, I think uh, I think it's it's worth it for us to to look at, uh, review, and, and revise. Um, because you don't want to go and lock up the meeting and have all these confidential discussions about uh, public assets. You want a level of, uh, of engagement from the public. So I think it's um, you know, that, and, and that's a um, you know, that's a tricky thing. Um, uh, I think that that's what we need to find the balance and, and engage with our residents and ratepayers um, uh, to a degree to get them um, on board with the project, and I guess um, get them to understand why we're. Uh, um, um, even uh, considering a, a proposal. And I think what we had before us in terms of um, uh, the crows coming forward, that was probably a prime example of um, 
why we um, need to look at this uh, policy and, uh, and try and improve it. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Oh, thank, thanks, um, Chair. Just a, a few questions for administration. And um, further to the point that uh, Councillor Abrahimsida has made, have administration had an opportunity to um, reflect on the unsolicited um, bids process and how it was used um, with respect to the Crows? And what learnings have they um, taken from that? I'd be really interested to, to know. See ya. Um, uh, thank you. So absolutely. Um, I think on reflection, uh, for me personally, and funnily enough, we've actually got an exact discussion later this week, um, just more broadly um, on, on those learnings. Um, for me, when it's a, a, it's back to the principle around public benefit, public value, um, and I think with hindsight, the mechanism to um, look at the future of something like an aquatic centre could have been achieved through an EOI process where council um, took control um, of what they wish to see for that site, whether it's 25 metres, 50 metres, and then sought, um, you know, tested with the market how, you know, who could partner with us to achieve the outcomes. So um, I think um, uh, I think some of the restrictions which really challenged council and the community around the confidentiality aspects really challenged everybody to be able to have an open, transparent uh, conversation um, around a, a real important um, you know, public policy discussion. So um, we'll be having further discussions um, this week. Um, and um, obviously it's important that we do reflect on um, lessons from that one, and to be fair, we've only had one formal uh, submission to date, is that right? That has achieved, that got as far as the Crows did. That's correct, we've had two formal submissions launched um, since oh, 2017. Oh, okay, two, two. So it's the, the uniqueness barriers usually, criteria is usually the one that challenges proponents to meet to even enable them to go through the process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just a, a bit more um, feedback around the uniqueness um, criterion. I, I guess I've always found that element a little bit troubling as well. Um, I'm keen to know, um, again from administration, how um, the proposal from the Crows satisfied the uniqueness um, criterion. If if what uh, um, taking on board what, what you've just said, um, acting CEO, that, that that could have gone out through a, an FOI process. I mean, how did the Crows proposal satisfy the uniqueness criterion? Was only one Crows. Acting CEO, I think the presiding member that was answered. I think um, on the floor of the chamber through various questions and motions on notice um, last year or the year before. Last year, year before. Not sure, but um, I'll, I need to go back and just check through that. I wasn't familiar with the process enough to be able to say to you tonight, but presumably it's in how, how it's constructed. Yeah, I think, I, actually, I think it was myself who asked the question at the time, and I can't quite recall, recall what the answer was either. So, um, yes, I, I'd appreciate um, getting some of that um, information. But the other thing I guess I, I take from this is, um, Brett made the point earlier around the fact that we've got to do what we can to um, protect the, the IP of a proponent. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that really problematic when we're talking about the parklands um, because, and, and I'm not criticising you, Brett, I take on board what you're saying, but, but I think that's really problematic when we're talking about public space because it makes it really difficult to be able to have open discussions with the community if we're focused on trying to protect um, the IP. Um, and uh, that was obviously the issue that uh, Council confronted with respect to the, the Crows. Um, and, uh, you know, my hope would be an easy solution is for us to just move the parklands out of that and have an FOI, um, uh, EOI, sorry, um, proposal um, dealing with any um, public space and then at least council can look at it and it can be done in a more transparent and open way and we have the flexibility to determine how we want the consultation to occur rather than us being hamstrung by a, uh, a process that's already you know predetermined. 
Councillor Moran. Uh, yeah, just to reiterate the intellectual property, the whole point of the problem in the parklands with the um, this method is that you can, because you're, it's all about protecting the um, their intellectual property, we can then not do our job as councillors exactly. on public land that they own by going to the owners of the land. The, um, this, this bid process puts all the uh, protection on the bidder. I mean, I mean the, the Crows thing was perfect. I mean, everybody complained every inch of the way. It satisfied nobody. There was nothing particularly unusual about the bid. The YMCA and the YMCA and several other church bodies had reason that they'd be interested, but we were constrained from going to them because of this stupid thing. Nobody on council liked it. If you want to do it in the CBD, well, they all voted against it when I tried to get rid of it, but um, they, they <laughs> privately don't like it. Um, in the parklands, it is so wrong. In the CBD, yeah, you know, you can do it. If uh, uh, the young man over there is worried about deals being done and everything, I tell you what, there's no suggestion of any corruption in the this bid, but if there ever was a process that is that you could drive a truck through for transparency. This is the one. Here, this is a singularly unusual bid. We're not going to talk to anybody else about it, and we're going to protect their um, intellectual ability. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to think um, a powerful CEO, a powerful person in a position <laughs> could. Uh, Nuclear accord um, could say, okay, I'm, going to use, I'm going to use this highly selective process, highly secret, no consultation communication with the ratepayers allowed at all. We complain about that then. We've had the perfect example of why it doesn't work in particular part dance. I don't care what you do in the CBD if you want to. Just meet people. I mean, there is no uh, approach that's that unusual that it can't be dealt with by our already existing process. If it, it just, I mean, I just can't believe we're discussing this for an hour. It didn't work. It was a nightmare. If you want to keep it in the CBD, do. I don't think you should either. But definitely not in the parklands. It's just you just can't do that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. No, we still would have I had you down. Oh, we can speak yeah, there if you want. I had you on my list, but no? Okay, Councillor Martin. Um, look, can I just say that this uh, discussion that we're having here is an illustration of why this committee process doesn't work. It is too constrained. It's directed solely by those questions. And then the speakers are constrained by don't mention history, don't debate, don't do this, don't do that. But that's, that's why it doesn't work. However, addressing uh, the matters that have been put before us specifically, the problem in all of this is that... Councillor seems to... Um, Councillor Martin is talking. Sorry, apologies, Councillor Martin. Oh, that's all right. Um, the problem with this... The problem with this is that it doesn't address the issue that Council didn't address. That is the threshold issue of what is our policy with regard to private development on the parklands. We do not have a policy. And, and whatever the learnings the administration says it took away, it's not evident here because we're being asked whether or not we want to apply unsolicited bids to the parklands and what sort of criteria that we use. Wrong question. Question is, as a body, make up your minds first. Do you want commercial development, offices, businesses on the parklands? That's, that's the first question. Then you go to the next. And until you answer that first question, there's no point in dealing with the others. Um, there's no point in saying, let's have an unsolicited bids process, but we'll exclude this part of the parklands or that part of the parklands, or when it's a particular proposal that meets this criteria. It's just a nonsense. Um, and until this council actually comes to grips with that issue of, do you want private development on public parklands, then at any moment, John Olson could come whistling through the door with a proposal that he hands to the CEO and says, I've got an unsolicited bid and this time we want Victoria Square. 
And you know, we'd be in exactly the same position. Everyone would be in the Can dark. Can we just get some clarification? We're, we're, we're not talking about development. I was about to say that, uh, you, Councillor Abrams, today, we aren't talking about, I'll let you have free reign on that, but we aren't talking about whether we want commercial development on the parklands. Well, we, we are, we are well, talking about. That's, that's exactly. That's no, exactly the We're talking exactly about the, the guidelines. Can I, can I please speak? Illustrates. Can I please speak? We are talking about the guidelines for the unsolicited proposal. That's what we're talking about. What would you like to see? If you, Councillor Sims has said that he doesn't want to see the parklands in there, that's fine. You're talking about that we're agreeing to commercial development. That's not what we're talking about. We are actually talking about the guidelines. That is it. What do you see? If that's what you want, Councillor Martin, to see no commercial development mentioned in the guidelines, then that's it. That's your feedback. But we're not talking about that. So, well, Chair, Chair I, thank you, I thank you very much for illustrating the exact point that I was making. You've underlined exactly You've underscored the, the problem. Yeah. Well, Perfect. that's what you are telling, giving direction in this discussion well, to administration. Let, all let I so. want, all our members, all I want tonight is just meaningful discussion for administration to have direction. That is all. Thank you. I have, Chair, I haven't finished discussing. I'll give you another minute. You have another minute, please. And, and hence the point that I made at the very beginning about the problem with this process. Now, if, if we accept these questions at face value, we are accepting that we want development on the parklands that is the subject of unsolicited proposals. That is the point that I'm making. And until you actually resolve that first question, then leaping forward confirms exactly what I'm saying. No lessons have been learned, none whatsoever. John Olson, anyone can walk through this door with an unsolicited bid for the parklands. And just like the team last time fell for it, when we nearly gave away the parklands to the Crows, we would nearly fall for it again. We're and in a, we'd be we in were the in. Same. I would like to clarify, Councillor Martin, that we did not give anything away. This council went through a consultation process. Uh, no, and that and is all. The there was no decision. No. There was no decision no. being made in this council. Can I just say, so, Chair? No, you it cannot. Is not, it actually, is not you cannot, Councillor Martin, so say. Really, your time is up. Thank Chair, you, you can't um, debate. You can't, you can't debate. debate. Stop I had to, to clarify what you had no, just you said. Debating, I Chair. did not, thank no. you, Councillor Martin. No, I clarified, you said that the, this council had made a decision. No decision had been made. I clarified that position to you and I said that we you went through still, a consultation. You are still debating, I clarified Chair. what you said. Well, um, Chair. So I, I would like to continue any further discussion on this topic here. Um, Justin, would you like to... Um, Summer, please. Thank you, Chair. I think we've heard a lot of interesting points tonight. The, the one which is most sensitive, obviously, is the park plans. And the expression of interest proposal can uh, accommodate with appropriate um, uh, guidelines in terms of the probity, other bids that come out. We're not just talking about uh, commercial uh, suggestions that come through. We're also talking about non-commercial. We're also talking about other things in the city. So we're happy to take on board what you've said tonight. I think we've got a, a general sense of what that, that that is, but I do accept that it's possible that one will follow the other. So if there's a bid, it could be commercial, it could be on the parkland. So um, I think you want the flexibility of what is needed in an EOI process and want to separate out the parklands. That's that's basically what I'm hearing, that you need the ability to consult on, on the parklands and you will be straitjacketed by a, 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 a um, unsolicited proposal. So uh, thank you for your comments and we'll take that on board and um, bring that back to council. Thank you members for your participation on this matter. Can we go to a 4.5 please, uh, regarding our Main Street Action Plans, Christy? Can I, at this point, are you go? Uh, can we take the papers as read, or would yeah. you like to go through a few things with, with uh, councillors? Through the chair, I've just got a few notes to help. Sure, direct. there's quite a lot of information in the pack. We've got six slides. Can I All right. Them? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, members, thank you. I have a few slides. I shall um, draw these these to your attention. There is the. Uh, Thank you. Um, 
Members, on the 15th of December 2020, you were provided with an update uh, on our new approach to the master plans, including um, the progress of the Main Street action plans and the draft action plans detailing the quick wins, short-term actions and indication of medium and long-term actions. Uh, in response to a successful motion on notice, the Hindley Street model has now been adopted for Hutt Street, O'Connor Street and Melbourne Street Main Streets, enabling us to progress the Main Street planning through a place model and evidence-based approach, utilising data, planning, work and commitments that are already in place. Um, the new Main Street's governance framework, which we've indicated here and I'm happy to take questions on, of course, will be implemented in a similar method to the Hindley Street model. However, the Main Street governance frameworks include, includes now place coordinators, acting as a single point of contact and coordination for each street. The implementation of an internal working group to ensure there is a focused and strong commitment to delivery. Through this approach, there will be multiple ways that the projects will engage with external and internal stakeholders to seek input and pulse check our quick wins and short term, medium, long term actions. In effect, all stakeholders will have a stronger connection to what is happening on the ground through regular communication and updates. I'll pass to Naini to continue. Uh, through the chair, thanks, Christy. Um, as Christy mentioned, the approach that we'll be taking is very much looking at the longer term vision. Um, and ensuring that we're taking a holistic approach similar to the Hindley Street model. Um, we'll be looking at not just one element, but all of the five key elements that make up a great place. So this is the economic, social, environmental, physical and cultural. And as part of this um, approach, the intention is to very much understand from the stakeholders and the community what's working well, what's not, the opportunities and also come to a collective um, shared vision and longer term outcomes for each of those main streets. So moving forward members will progressively deliver outcomes on the street which will address not only the current needs um, but also look at the longer term vision and plan and how we can use an evidence based approach to look at the solutions uh, that will then inform the, the next stages as we move through the life cycle of these main street projects. We'll be looking to develop three distinct plans. Um, these being an activation plan, improvement plan and an engagement PR and marketing plan. So the activation plan will look at the quick wins, but in the form of uh, on-street activations, music, art trails, public art, lighting, but also feeding to the longer term shared vision and objectives of those streets. The improvement plan will look at quick wins through to the long term sustainable change. Um, so it could be on-street improvements, greening projects and permanent infrastructure upgrades. And finally, the engagement PR and marketing plan will, in the first instance, look to raise the profile of those main streets, um, creating a destination and really building on the street's individual unique character um, and also ensuring that all of the stakeholders are continually updated and provided information on how each of these plans is progressing. So all of this work will inform the vision and planning for the streets and in hopefully identify investment opportunities with the intent of securing external funding and partnerships to improve the main streets over time. So all of this work will form part of, is part of the master plan process and leads to uh, the implementation of long-term change. Uh, members, we shared in the pre-reading the next steps and key priorities. Um, so just very quickly, continue the Lord Mayor round tables, conduct workshops with the elected members and key stakeholders for each of the main streets, actively promote, um, as Christy mentioned, the place coordinator, single point of contact to all of the stakeholders within the streets. So that includes the businesses, uh, the residents, building owners, etc. Um, commence the intercept surveys and direct engagement, develop the and implement the activation, improvement and engagement PR plans, continue to implement the quick wins and deliver quarterly committee updates and regular emails to the Lord Mayor and elected members. So members, um, that's all from us and we'd now like to seek your feedback and thoughts on two, two key questions that are on the screen. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Chair, and, and through you, I just want to really commend um, this report. This is 
the the best and most comprehensive explanation of an approach to how we would tackle the master plan um, uh, for each of these streets. Um, uh, had, had I known in March 2019 that the traditional approach to a master plan uh, seven to ten years away from doing anything meaningful, <laughs> I think we probably would have changed the language and perhaps we would agree with um, uh, me there. So it has been a point of consternation that it has not progressed quicker to date. I'm so pleased that this team has uh, taken the bull by the horns there. Um, uh, what, what, what I would say is that um, uh, we still do need, in my view, um, uh, the approach to take into account uh, infrastructure upgrades and, and earlier on in the piece, at least to flag that we might want to do them. I'm not saying base your approach off of an infrastructure upgrade, upgrade um, because you can have the best laid street because there's no one there using it and what's the point. Um, but I just think that should be ready early on so that if you get some momentum in a street and if you get a lot of success from the program that you're implementing, you've got um, uh, real teeth to go to us or another government and say, hey, we want to really turbocharge this street. We think, you know, this funding could do that. So I think that needs to be incorporated early on. Um, uh, and as well, uh, I, I do think that elected member engagement should be a little bit heavier, a little bit earlier on. Um, I, I noticed uh, the way I see it is that, you know, there are going to be workshops with stakeholders and, and workshops with um, uh, with uh, with elected members, but I think there should be the opportunity for them to, to convalesce a, a little bit earlier, um, uh, maintaining, of course, the, the the independence and authority of the Lord Mayor's roundtables, because I think they're very useful. And the fact that we're getting the minutes from them, I think is very helpful as well. Um, uh, and finally, um, same with engaging elected members earlier on, I think we should be engaging the public earlier on as well. And then perhaps that feedback can be brought back to the Lord Mayor's roundtables and to um, elected members in those various workshops and, and considered in those forums. I, I, I see great value in taking um, some of the workings that you've got already and saying, just offering it up to the public and saying, hey, what do you think of this? Do you have any other ideas? Are there any blind spots or things that we're missing? I think that's really, really valuable because I would hate, you know, there are so many people involved in this and the round table can only capture so many views. I would hate for us to be missing things. Um, and I think you've done a monumental amount of work. There's lots of data there and what have you. Um, but even potentially it could be taking some of the prop propositions and the visions laid out at the Lord Mayor round table, putting that out to the public and saying, hey, what do you think of this? What other views do you have? Um, so I think that should be done a little bit earlier on as well. Thanks. Um, Chair, and look, I agree with what um, Alex uh, has um, has said. I guess the only thing I'd add, for me, there's always a bit of a tension in this process around where do specific initiatives um, fit? You know, so for instance, if a councillor wants to see lighting in North Adelaide, where does that fit? Or if a councillor has a proposal around pavers on Hindley Street, where does that fit? What tends to happen um, is, um, you know, used to be the language was well, that will go in a master plan and, you know, you will see action on that in the next 10 or 20 years. Now um, it's, it goes into an action plan, but you'll see action on it, you know, in the fullness of time um, or when, you know, when, when time permits. Um, but I think there needs to be a recognition that for us as elected members, um, often we have members of the community who will come to us with things that they consider to be pressing, like lighting in North Adelaide, for instance. Um, and it would be great if there was a mechanism to be able to get action on that, um, you know, because you could potentially have a resolution of council and yet still have no action on an initiative like that. Um, so for me, I, I'm just interested to know how we, how we take that on board. I don't have a, a clear suggestion, but I, I think um, great to have the plans, but we also need the rubber to hit the road in terms of the rollout. And I think elected members will play a really important role in terms of getting that intel and those ideas from the community. Um, and so there needs to be scope for our initiatives to be included within any action plan. Thank you, Councillor uh, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, uh, I'm just taking on board some of the discussion there. there um, 
I, I guess a great example of, again, uh, the Highland Street Roundtable is that some of the work that has been presented to you has gone to the Highland Street Roundtable for the footpath extensions. And so uh, when we met, we actually sat with them and said, well, here's several options. Let's talk through each of those. What does that mean to you as a street? And then we're taking, consolidating their views and taking three of those options through Andrew Wallace to uh, work in the West End Association so that we'll actually have a bigger gathering. And in the meantime, we'll um, make sure that the elected members are across that and they'll be invited to those forums. So there, there is the intention to have um, elected member engagement, direct engagement with that. Um, equally with the um, um, Hart Street at the moment, uh, there's a few um, aspirational ideas coming forward. What we want to do is try to work with them to a collective vision, what that might be, and then we would like to invite the elected members to come and actually talk through that with the members of that round table so that we can actually put it forward <laughs> with a view that we will obviously work on our quick wins and our improvement plans, etc. but we will have a longer term view that we can then pitch for various funding because, um, you know, I don't want to wait 15 years before we do anything in those streets. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the mechanism, that's a really good point. So we'll talk about how we'll do that, what the mechanism is, but certainly those forums will be, everybody will be invited. Um, the round table and the elected members have a general discussion of where it's up to. And, and then we'll have a forum, which is inviting everybody from the area to come together to see where we're up to and get their feedback as well. Yeah. So there's lots of I think that's a crucial sort of, bit, isn't it? Yeah. You know, um, and that's some of the stuff that we've been working through is um, where we're up to with each of these groups and when we go out, etc. Yeah. But I'd like to thank you for the work you've done. It's fantastic. And I love the single point of contact. We've needed that since we got rid of the last single point of contact, which is when we threw a few things out. Councillor Martin. The action plans at page 61 record under Melbourne Street um, an improvement in the next six months to include smart parking. What is that, please? Sorry, which slide? So there's a suggestion. Page, there for page 61 of the. To us, Main Street action plans, what can be expected on our Main Streets in the next six months? Slide and then 14. at Found it. Thank the you. seven lines, smart parking. Well, Councillor, smart parking is when um, you put in place um, your sensors into the ground um, and it um, goes to, yeah, we've already got 2,800 um, across the city. Um, and it um, helps uh, people manage their parking on street parking um, requirements. So. so, is it the intention that those will be used in association with the Smart Parking Act? If it was to go in, then I would absolutely be advising it was um, connected to our existing Smart Parking project. And the Smart Parking App includes fees for parking? Would it include that as well? Potentially, yes, but uh, hasn't been explored in any depth as far as I'm aware, has it, Noni? Mm. Uh, through the Chair, no, it hasn't. It was just an idea that was floated um, that would be put forward for discussion um, with the stakeholders through uh, the Lord Mayor's Roundtable and then the broader community forums to see if that was something that they would like explored as part of the longer term planning. So when we see this, what can be expected on our main streets in the next six months, they're not actually proposals, they're discussion points. Uh, through the chair, yes, that's correct, Councillor Martin. Um, and we're currently, um, through the uh, roundtables that have been held to date, some of these things have been uh, proposed or floated as ideas and we're seeking feedback on that. Um, and if there's feedback that you would like to provide this evening, that would be great. Otherwise, there'll be the broader discussion uh, with the elected members about what we're hearing from the Lord Mayor's roundtables and then through to the community engagement sessions also. Well, 
Um, yeah, look, I would like to provide feedback. Um, for near on 20 years, uh, Melbourne Street and O'Connell Street have fought paid parking and parking meters and parking fines. And indeed, the local business association um, was, um, and it would be now 22, 23 years ago, involved in almost a physical skirmish as somebody tried to install parking meters on O'Connell Street. Um, I would urge council uh, and the Lord Mayor especially to not discuss the introduction of parking meters in Melbourne Street or indeed any further in North Adelaide than they are already installed. It is by and large, contrary to the view of most people um, on Team Adelaide, it is by and large a residential area. It is not a commercial district. It's a residential area with commercial activity. And that is why residents have fought it so strongly. So please, no paid smart parking in Melbourne Street or near it. In respect of the other discussion points, I would just ask uh, that the Lord Mayor and the administration aim higher. Um, decluttering and deep cleans, um, trial lighting, illumination, cheery flowers, refresh and repaint are actually called business as usual. Business as usual. If you're actually going to do something for a precinct, that's a given. You make sure it's tidy, you make sure it's attractive. If you're then going to contribute to an uplift in the area, you embark on other projects and they don't include cleaning and street lights and the like. Um, that's what every business in, in North Adelaide has expected for years. Doesn't always get it, but that's what it's expected. So uh, this represents nothing more than business as usual. And I guess uh, I would say to the team as well that um, identifying uh, the prospect for real infrastructure development, real improvements in uh, North Adelaide, and suggesting, and I'm saying to the Lord Mayor as well, because this is her forum and her plan, um, I'm saying that uh, telling people that the earliest they can expect this is not this term of council, not next term of council, but the term after, is a completely unsatisfactory response. And that's what it says. Five years plus, seven years plus for the delivery of uh, the design phase isn't until after five years. Look at the documents. Seven years before we start some kind of construction. Now, uh, you know, the, the people of North Adelaide will be distraught to hear this. And I would have thought precincts all over the city will. I am just grateful that the Lord Mayor is taking personal responsibility for this plan because it is not one any other elected member would want to take forth. CEO, did you want to clarify any of that? <laughs> Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes, through the chair, um, I'll let Tom just um, clarify a couple of things. But on, on the on the master plan, um, the beauty of of Hindley Street model, which we've replicated across the um, these other main streets, is that um, every four years there's an election. Um, what tends to happen is there is a change in the elected body. Priorities change. We have had um, in the long term financial plan. Um, upgrades for Hindley Street for many, many years. And so what happens is um, the people that live and work around Hindley Street are consistently expecting council at some point to deliver on a master plan for Hindley Street, you know, costed of 15 to 12 million. But it keeps moving further and further away um, to the point where we were asked to put in place a round table and actually get on with um, priorities and short-term actions to enable, um, you know, the street to, um, you know, have some sort of focus. Um, so I think Tom's going to um, just give you a bit more clarity on a couple of things. I think what I would say is that um, Council around did call master plan something around where streets go to die or dreams go to die. I think I think what's important is that. 
um, as a priority for this council term. You have all made it absolutely clear consistently that you want to see um, actions happening on the street, and I think what this model does is enable that to happen, but Tom will just clarify a couple of other things. Um, QCO through you, Chair. Just, just coming back to smart parking, and you heard what you said, Councillor uh, Martin. First of all, smart parking isn't only about charging for parking, it isn't about ticket machines. Smart parking sometimes is actually to assist residents, to assist businesses where people don't overstay in parking bays. So it actually frees up for short-term usage or it regulates that usage in support of the community in North Adelaide. So it's not always connected to revenue. So that, that, that's, you know, that, that's important to note. In regards to the, um, having had the privilege to attend uh, the Melbourne Street uh, Roundtable, which was absolutely fantastic, is from my, from my perspective is the community are actually saying that they want quick wins. They want things which are tangible now that can be delivered. And it's not always about lighter, quicker, cheaper, but it's about actually action. So, and some of the things that are identified here are things that could probably be implemented very quickly. I think the other thing is sometimes we're confusing a main street master plan or, or a, a place model with the strategic asset plan. And if you remember some time ago, Councillor, I think you raised the question with me is how much do we actually spend in main, main streets? And I actually done a uh, scenario where the money that we're spending on Connell Street and in Melbourne Street and in the East End. So the reality is that there is a con considerable amount of asset spend, capital spend in these precincts. The reality is, are we spending the right way to support these precincts in regards to economic development or to increase values of properties and whatever? That's a question that we need to go through. But I wouldn't confuse the strategic asset plan with what's here. It's part of, and it's part of a broader plan. So I could say what, what I've heard so far from the community is they are really keen that we actually start to look at very simple deliverables that they can actually see traction on the street and that's either through some of the things here but also is how are we going to invigorate how are we going to assist them to get through what is challenging times anyone else yeah, yeah. Um, uh, tom, tom touched on what i was going to ask which was can parking be used just to measure demand and availability? I, I, I certainly did not see a move for paid parking when I saw that. Um, but good on Councillor Martin for picking it up um, and reiterating the point. Uh, I would just ask is the, um, well, I just make a quick point first, and that is that yes, it certainly is business as usual, or it should be business as usual. The very problem we're having this discussion is because it hasn't been business as usual, and it has not been business as usual for a very, very, very long time. Um, and that's why I'm so pleased with the work that's been done uh, today and by the Lord Mayor and, and, and by others. But um, I, I, the only thing I wanted to ask was around the um, the uh, SPOC, the single point of contact. Um, are we as elected members going to be able to engage meaningfully and regularly with the single points of contact? Or what's, and I'm assuming it's going to be a separate person for each street? Tom? Through you, presiding member, yes, there'd be a nominated person for the street. The, the only question I would ask you for what intent would you wish to engage with single point of contact? Because naturally, what we're trying to do is to to put them in places where it really matters with the community so they can hear it. They will be bringing information back and it will be coordinated and brought back to council for consideration. So you will get the opportunity, but certainly we're happy to introduce and work with the elected members in regards to that. Yeah, well, I suppose just to answer the, the question that was actually um, posed is, uh, you know, elected members generally know their communities pretty well and they have people that have proposals and ideas and something they want to do, or uh, it could be a landlord with a vacant shop who needs some advice on what's best to put here. Um, and, you know, looking at the place working group, which includes someone from the Economic Development Agency, um, may be able to give the uh, SPOC advice as to what as to what is best to put in that shop front. And it's more of a, the, the, the premise of my question is that they can be someone who elected members can lean on to problem solve on their main streets. And I think that would, if that's the intent, if we can, that would be very valuable. 
Um, yes, yeah, so thank you through the chair. Um, yes, absolutely. So um, what we're what the important thing is is that these um, people are based on the street and not necessarily based in the CLC building. So that's what's going to be quite different this time around. So um, obviously they will get to know the community really well. Um, and absolutely any sort of insights or data. I would just ask that you channel it through Christy and Noni, who will have sort of um, overall responsibility for um, staffing matters. So, um, but these uh, single point of contacts will, and place coordinators will be um, externally focused. Okay, thank you, Noni. Um, I'm just want to add thank you for all the work that you've been doing and thank you to the Lord Mayor for engaging um, with people in regards to in a more intimate setting to be able to arrive to um, a more meaningful discussion as Councillor Hyde has pointed out it has been a very long time and um, I think you know um, I've been seeing the same thing nothing changing on the on the streets of O'Connell Street and Melbourne Street um, for a very long time. So instead of um, councillors bringing in motion after motion with no clear direction, this offers a clear direction in where we should be going. And I do thank you for for that. Um, our main streets are really important. And um, I, I, I note as what uh, Councillor Martin has called business as usual. Um, but um, I also like to see um, a lot more experiences uh, on the street, uh, you know, Connell Street and Melbourne Street to attract more people to come and and, um, experience a precinct um, and uh, we are in a position to um, you know obviously do that and talk with the traders with what they feel would complement their business in doing so um, and uh, with also with residents as well um, so to have those discussions is is really good so I do thank you and I think we're heading in the right direction Meetings closed. Goodbye.